Hello, and welcome back to SITSAI Oz 21. We hope you're enjoying the conference so far. My name is Erin Roger, and I'm the chair of the Australian Citizen Science Association, and I'm also with the Atlas of Living Australia. I wanted to begin this session by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land of which we're all joining from today. I'm joining you from Gadigal country. And I'd also like to welcome back Costa. So Costa opened the conference, but we're really pleased to have him back for his keynote address. Costa is a landscape architect, environmental educator, host of the TV show Gardening Australia. Costa translates his awe in nature and science that drives it into stories that are meaningful for all ages. He loves children and young people, abundantly sharing his enthusiasm, knowledge, and networks so that they can equip themselves with the skills and experience to lead the new conversations required in an uncertain and changing world. He believes that including our elders and recognizing an intergenerational community narrative helps us grow an inclusive and regenerative future. This capacity to engage and entertain across generations sees him constantly traveling around the country, sharing the messages of his heart from preschools to conferences, community events to keynotes. Costa believes in embracing and celebrating Mother Nature's cycles and seasons and nurturing her balanced beauty and bounty organically. His holistic approach is all about gardening the soul and the soil. So we are so pleased to welcome you, Costa. Over to you. Thank you, Erin, and um, good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to, to be here this afternoon. Um, it was wonderful to be a part of the launch yesterday and to, to uh, dip into some of the wonderful um, short chats and, uh, and get so many great ideas, which, which is really what a conference is about. It's about bringing people together. It's about sharing yarns. And, and that's what uh, Michael was talking about yesterday in the uh, welcome. Uh, that was very, that was very clear theme through what he spoke about. Um, in saying that, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from here in, uh, in Sydney on Gadigal and Bidigal land of the Eora. And I acknowledge elders past, present and emerging and, and in a, in an event like this, I take that further and I acknowledge the, the country and the nature of the land that we are all on, wherever we are. And if you want to drop into the chat uh, where you're listening from, so I can get a bit of a feel for, for where, you're all, uh, where you're all coming from. But it is, it is about nature. It is about our connection to country. And this is this is reiterated in, in welcomes whenever we have events now. And I think that is such a, a critical part about the importance of our connection to the land and to our life and to the science that we connect with when it, when it comes to being anywhere and doing anything. And, and that whole idea that we can acknowledge this, that we take the time that we actually stop for a moment and say, this is where I am. And, and I think about that a lot when I travel. And it's interesting because when I think about the children that I, I'm privileged to share time with and provide information and discussion with, you know, I wasn't in that orbit when I was growing up. We, we didn't have those same those same structures in place and it's never too late i think that's a really important part that that there is no need to have pride about these things or or we, we need to leave the guilt we need to leave the angst we lead to because really what that is is fear and and when we carry that fear it's debilitating it breaks down our capacity to really cut to the truth and if we are the custodians of the facts that I talked about yesterday, then we have this responsibility to replenish, to acknowledge, to, to welcome our, our, our presence in a place, to see and observe. Moments before I came up to log in to the, to the green room for the chat, I was down at my nature pond and I saw two dragonflies 
And I thought that's interesting because they were moving quite slowly and I, well, it was moving slow. And I thought, what is that? And I realized it was two dragonflies mating and I hadn't seen that before. And they stopped on this downpipe and I got a ladder and I climbed up and I was ready to take a photo. And then I bumped the pipe and off they flew. <laughs> so, you know, my, my uh, fantastic citizen science was, was on the pulse almost. And I would have loved to have shared that photo. Um, but, but this is what's going on around us all the time. And, and I think, I think we have this incredible opportunity to not only capture those moments, but to share them. And that's our role as, as scientists and as citizen scientists, it's our opportunity to, to tell these yarns, to catch these yarns, to share them in a way that it's appropriate to that audience. And I'm very fortunate in what I do to be able to speak from as young as kindy and preschool right through to elders and, and beyond. And that I think is our biggest challenge and it's our biggest opportunity to be able to see through, to cut through complicated stories and be able to find the right portions to deliver to the right context of the gathering. Who am I talking to? And what do I need to engage, inform, and entertain. And the entertainment part is critical. And I'm not saying entertain with song and dance. Well, actually, I am saying that because music and dance and art are very big ways that we can get messages across. But it's about, it's about creating entertainment that captures attention. And when we capture attention, then we leave some little legacy that might be just the cue that people then follow up so that then I, I've spoken about dragonflies today and I hope that that puts a little flag in your orbit and you see a dragonfly this afternoon or tomorrow or in the next week and I'd really love that idea that when you see that dragonfly you think of not just me you think about why you thought of me and that was because of the conference and then because of the conference you start to think about some of the other people that you saw and then you may follow up on something that you hadn't done and it's this capacity to tag and layer and create these threads through our learning that we don't have a fear to have to dump everything out in in that one conversation, in that one yarn. And that's one thing that I've learned through, through doing, well, well, any of you that have done anything to do with production, whether it's television production or film production, or whether it's even, even writing, there's this constant need to edit and, and, and cut, cut down to that, to that fine line of, well, what really matters? And what matters is our capacity to understand these stories, understand the science, which is a story, and then how we project it, how we, when, when I'm speaking to, to primary school students, I don't dumb anything down. I don't delete. It's really just about the presentation, not about the facts. Because as I mentioned yesterday, nature tells the truth and this is really what citizen science, I think, has the opportunity to launch into this decade of the, the 2020s. This is our opportunity to really launch into that, that nature tells truth. How do we interpret that truth and share that truth for others to join, to join the canoe and start paddling and sharing the journey themselves. That's the bit that excites me the most because we're, we're in disturbing times at the moment, particularly when it comes to truth, when it comes to media, when it comes to where we get our facts. And those facts are being manipulated. Our truth is being shielded. There's veneers, there's, there's all sorts of 
there's all sorts of, of smoke and mirrors going on and fake news has been a very convenient way of undermining these truths. It's been a convenient way of developing fear. And once we go into fear, we, we miss out. We don't see those truths. They get, they get sidelined. And, and I think when I look at what's gone on, particularly over the last couple of years, people have turned to citizen science. And, and how you define citizen science, I can define it in lots of different ways. Um, you know, first of all, National Science Week, of course. That's citizen science per se. It is science endorsed. But all of the other activities around it, how people latch into citizen science, this is our opportunity to create those yarns and most of all, create those connections that not only celebrate what people are doing, but make, make the layers understood that this isn't just a pastime. This is a passing of the knowledge. These are captured observations. That just because it's just because it's in 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 a, a, a folder or in a, a course or in a university or in a laboratory, nature is the laboratory of life. And when we're out there in that laboratory, our observations matter because they're the most important observations in our local microclimates, in our local environment. And as we understand that, it gives us gravity and weight and buoyancy at the same time. It gives us the strength of gravity, but the buoyancy and lightness of truth. And when we have that truth, and when we understand that as custodians of these facts, we've got this responsibility to really push out of our comfort zone, to be disturbed and think about how I can change this piece of information and tell it in an engaging way so that we get lean forward moments, so that we get like my little neighbours, Max and Alyssa, coming up the street every night to see the worms, to see my frog pond, my nature pond. I layer more information every time they come. They wanna see the chickens, talk to them about what the chickens do. I talk to them about the tadpoles. We look at that, we take, we, we engage. While I'm doing that, their parents are listening. People are listening to everything that we say and, and that capacity to, to develop narrative, to, to, to adorn it, to, to, to hang different aspects off it so that you see it as this wonderful three-dimensional foreground, middle ground, background. What do we bring forward at this moment? How do we play it back? That's what, that's what citizen science is about because, you know, when I think about groups, you know, I think about some, something like Grow It Local and how they're connecting local people with other growers. So these are local custodians of local facts sharing their facts with other local people. I, I could look at Water Night and the role that Water Night plays in engaging people with the water cycle and the importance of water in our lives and having to go for 12 hours without water to then understand that and to bring those scientific pieces of information front and center. I could talk about Community Gardens Australia because in Community Gardens, you have an incredible amount of truth. You have observations being captured <laughs> literally every day and people sharing those observations and sharing those skills. And each and every one of the presenters here today has a skill and how we present and how we take it. This one here, is all about, uh, this is Kit Prendergast and, and um, she's a, a wonderful entomologist and scientist looking at the importance of our native bees and, and, and pollinators and how, how developing our naturehoods to accommodate the conditions needed for them to thrive and regenerate is something that we can really champion as citizen scientists. And where do we connect? Where do we connect with different people? And, and how, we all speak of biodiversity, but how biodiverse is my message in terms of where it's reaching? Am I just going out to a limited group? How much further can I take my message? How can I connect with 
something like junior land care and take my messages out into that group. Um, it could be through Farm It Forward and young people getting into growing in people's backyards because they don't have land, but other people have land. And these are all ways that, that we are taking, taking the joys of life, the joys of nature, um, the joys of health and nurture and connecting them with the science base and making that story happy. I, you, you know what I want? I would like, I would really like for people to work hard at changing the perception around science that, you know, for too long science has been, oh, well, that's something geeky. Well, no, it's not. And what I'm seeing in citizen science is people taking that passion and hanging it up there. Every scientist is passionate. And what our chance in citizen science brings is that opportunity to put that passion out there. We have platforms we can share. So for all the, for all the negative that these social platforms bring, there is incredible positive. And I see that and I use that and I work that through Gardening Australia. We are an amazing amplifier for getting citizen science out there through my social media channels, whether that be Facebook, Instagram, um, Twitter, and TikTok. Like we can put our heads in the sand and go for the non-diversity. Oh, that's, you know, that's not my realm. Or you say, no, well, that's where the audience is. That's where the next generation is. If you put your head in the sand, you won't connect with them. They won't connect on the old platforms at 5.30 on a Friday night or 8.30 on a Sunday night to watch a movie. No, that's not what people do. So there's this chance for us to really give science. And, and that's what all of you are doing as citizen scientists. You, you're taking this information and you're giving it traction. You're giving it you're giving it an engagement and a passion and you're putting the awe in it, like a, a real awe in the information. And it doesn't have to be volumes. It's about picking the really interesting pieces out there to create the hook that gets people excited and they bring themselves in. And that capacity to nurture people in, to put to put really engaging signage along their path and say, have a look at this. What about that? Have you considered this? These people are doing awesome things. Here's a link. Here's a connection. Go and check out this talk. Have a look at this book. Follow this person on social media. There's so many ways that we can, we can amplify citizen science as the broader amplifier of science on the whole. And I'd urge every one of us in what we do every day to remember that we are amplifying 24 seven, the way we speak, the language we choose, where we say things, how we bring in people. We're one big community. And the more we throw, the more we throw life rafts, the more we throw ladders, the more we throw these links to people, then the more that we can bring them through the, the lens of citizen science, which is not intimidating, it's welcoming, it's engaging, and then that's career building. And that will take them through that pathway and into a life of science. So that that's the that's the way I'm seeing the turbulent aspects of the disturbance that we've been living under for the last two years. I think it's it's really lifted citizen science to, to a, an incredible place of opportunity. I acknowledge the wonderful work that's being done. And I think each and every one of us, regardless of our position, regardless of, of what science background we have, we are living, breathing, scientific um, entities every day by way of survival we are dealing with science and um yeah focus those stories think if it doesn't get through the first time rather than go oh you know oh well, what could i do to 
to massage that message and to get to get the link of the lead so that the AMP puts it out there. That's what excites me. That's what I love about citizen science. And to Erin and everyone um, at the at behind the conference and behind bringing all these people together, congratulations because I'm I'm really excited about what this decade can bring for citizen science and what citizen science can bring for this decade because we need it and we need your individual and our collective amplifiers cranking it up. Thank you so much, Costa. I wish you could see the chat. Everyone's um, flooding in from all over Australia and globally and putting in where they're dialing in from today. So inspiring, so much online applause, so much love, so much shouting from the rooftop. So um, <laughs> thank you so much. I heard oh. that we need to work hard at changing the perception of science and that we need to put the awe into it. And citizen science is a main amplifier for doing that. So super, super inspirational words. Um, a few shout outs in particular that I wanted to say, one from Oliver Knox, who apparently once met you while frog dreaming. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a, oh, that is, that was a fantastic project. I've, up in northern New South Wales, I love frog dreaming. And, and I mean, that's the thing that I was talking about with language, like frog dreaming. I don't care, like anyone that sees that, they're just going to go, what? I want to be a part of that, you know? And so the, 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 the language we use is so critical because if, if we if we just fall into that trap of of just making it dry, there's nothing dry. And and I love I love the dryness of scientists. And I think there's this chance to to use language uh, to 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 make it to make it want you know to to really build that to, to amplify that all. Wonderful, um, and I your your message about storytelling really resonated. Dr. Carl had the same advice for us last night, and I've also just read it in the book, which is one of our conference prizes about how much you value storytelling. And there's some really, really inspirational things that um, you say in this book. Um, and um, I love how you say it's, a, it's about a recipe of balance between feeling a connection of the heart with the science of the head and mixed generously with the actions of the hands, heart, head, and hands, and in this order. I love that. Yeah, it's, inter it's uh, that's really interesting that you picked that bit out, Erin, because when I first started the book, my idea was head, heart, hands. What I wanted to do was say, oh, look at this awesome science around pollinators. Um, ra -da 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 -da. You know, this is, this, is, this is the science. And then I'll uh, look at, oops, oh, we're back. Um, yeah, so I was, my, my initial thoughts were, look at this awesome science. This is why I love it. This is the heart reason. And then here's what you can do about it. But then I thought about it and I thought, no, when I when I kind of started to write and started to do things, I thought, no, it's got to be the heart first because we need to engage people first and then say, yeah, well, this is why I'm pumped about the uh, pollination. These are the facts that I'm pumped about and here's how you can bring pollinators into your orbit. So... So yeah, that really wow. You you yeah, that's it. That's the that that's the essence of of what I how I structured that writing. But it's really the essence of what we do with the sh with you know what I do with anything that I do. I mean, if you don't get people engaged, it doesn't matter. Like you, you it has to be in that 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 order. You you got to you got to get them engaged and then then discuss the the the. the fold the, the, the interest in there and then the action. I think it's great advice. So the questions are, are streaming in, so I better get to them because we're running out of time. Bill wants to know, so there's been a significant amount of research showing that children begin to express preferences in particular disciplines during their early schooling. How can we get children to help paddle the canoe long-term? <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Bill. That one just came. I haven't done the old canoe paddle before, but I, I could feel 
I don't know. I, I can feel the, the room here, even though we're online. Don't worry. I, I feel like you're with me. Um, no question. Otherwise, I wouldn't be firing up. Um, um, how do we get them? I, I think I think it goes back, Bill, to what I was saying about, you know, that that opportunity, whether you have children in primary school or not, whether you have children in high school or not, seeing how the work you do can fold into curriculum, seeing how the work you do can connect with community-based projects and taking it to them, like proactively, you know, contacting Landcare, contacting your local school and saying, hey, you know, I'm, I'm an entomologist, I'm doing some work in this, have you got native bees, have you thought about making it? So there's ways that we, we, we need to step up and, and, and take it proactively forward because if ever there was a time where we needed it, we need it now. And don't, and don't take any no as a rejection. I never take no as a rejection. I take it as a timing thing. And then just go back around and pick your next angle of entry. And I'll take it more as my, my thing, not, not their thing. And, and when you do that, you don't feel bad. You actually think, oh, how can I do this differently? This is a, this is a challenge rather than rejection. Ha, rejection. Don't worry about rejection. Rejection's good because it, it helps you recalibrate and actually maybe say, now's not the time. Like it's just, nah, under that boss, it's not going to happen. So why bang my head? I'll... I'll, I'll I'll go a, a totally different thing and just put it on hold or put it in orbit and then reel it in again when it happens. So I think, yeah, be be receptive and flexible rather than than oh yeah, this is this is the best thing. I, and, and I've been there, I've been there, and I know that feeling. And just ratchet things slowly, and you'll 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 you'll, you'll all of a sudden realise that with small moves, you're suddenly looking in a new direction, and you've you've changed the canoe, and you you're bringing people on board and you, you, it's not overloaded. I think that's great advice. I've, I had a mentor that once said to me, say yes to everything unless it's going to kill you. Um, and I've, I've tried to follow that advice. <laughs> <laughs> Got another question here from Oliver. He's wondering if you can identify the hooks ahead of casting or do we just need to cast a lot or are there more targeted and repeated messages more effective than lots of different ones? Yeah, that, that Oliver, you're spot on there, and, and I think I think it is a case of different of different hooks because you know in some ways there's there's some actions and some projects you're doing that are are really just the burly that are just throwing it out there to garner some some interest, and then there might be other hooks that you're putting out on a longer line saying that's just going to drag and we're just going to leave that there in the knowledge that it's. It, it, it can and will get something, but we will also work on other ways to bring thing to, things to that. And, and, then, and then there's other things that we're working more readily that we go, okay, we're, we're, we'll target that area there because we can see that there's some action there. So it, that way you're not, you're not putting all your cookies in one basket and feeling that A, rejection, or B, being being um, not diverse enough. And, and I think that happens a lot when people say, oh, well, let's just get gardeners into a community garden. No, no, get the foodies on board, get the, get the people interested in, in flowers and growing different plants, get, get the restaurants and the local businesses on board, put it out there to lots of different people because at their core, they've got the same, the same um, DNA in, in terms of wanting to connect even though people have been disturbed and had problems and been, you, you know, been forced down roads, our opportunity is to bring them back to that, 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 that truth of nature and, when the, and, and allow them to see it. And the, the, the more you can coach your narrative in a way that it's, it coaxes the response to come out of them rather than you just giving it, uh, then, then, then it creates that, that hunger when when you talk about something and then people ask you the question then you can say well since you asked which is very different to me saying you need to know this and you need to know that and you this and you that 
as opposed to, oh, think about that and what about this? And they go, oh, what does this mean? Oh, well, since you asked, let's get into it. And that changes it. It disarms it. It gives you a, a, a comrade feel rather than a, 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 a position of, of power and instruction. And, and yeah, that, that leveling, and, and that's what I like about citizen science as a, call it a hashtag, call it a context, call it a, an entity, you know, that there's, there's this inclusiveness and the more inclusive we can be, then the more we really have that, that blanket. I was talking to someone about this earlier today, you know, stitch away at your, your crochet and make your little squares in the knowledge that it's going to become this big blanket and don't, don't underestimate the little square stitching that's key you know that is like those little lines you know stitch away drop one pearl one stitch one you know da, 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 da. you know and then all of a sudden suddenly you've got a blanket then you've got an entire park and then you've got an entire neighborhood and then you know and it just grows so so yeah that goes back to um i think it was oliver's question about how many how do we do it yeah don't underestimate the little square, which starts with a little square. <laughs> and then it's 10 squares in one little one. And then you stitch 10 tens together and there's a hundred. And then you stitch 10 of 10 tens together and, you know, away we go. Thank you so much, Costa. We're, we're pretty much out of time. Uh, just one final question. I read in the book that health and happiness was your grandmother's mantra. And we'd love to know what your mantra is. Oh, gee. <laughs> oh, yeah, that one, that, well, that one, that, that, that's one that's stuck with me. That's stuck with me for my whole life. And I, I, I kind of, you know, that, that was something that they talked about, she talked about all the time. What's mine? Um, I think, I think we're, we have, we're constantly being listened to. And yeah, just, just be wary of your language because our language is, is the true window to our heart. And if the language isn't coming out right, then adapt the language to, to connect to the heart. And I, I, I think, I think, you know, that the heart, the heart is what we need in this next decade. We need a lot of heart going forward. I love it. Very sage advice. Well, <laughs> on behalf of everyone, and really there is so much love and so much, so many hellos in the chat. I just wanted to thank you so much for opening the conference and coming back again today. And we really appreciate your considered words and thoughts. Thank you so much, Costa. Absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you, Erin. And thanks everyone for, for, for all the energy you're sharing in the chat and for being part of this and taking, taking citizen science further. It's, it's unreal.